alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mirë se erdhët në impact takohemi në një emision të radhës, sot me dy të ftuar shumë të veçant, glenë të përmëndin, të ftuarën e parë, en singleton, kode bane. Ajo ka qënë e ftuar në emisionin ton, një intervjis që ne kemi bërë në përmjet Skype-it, lidhur me organizatën që është prezent në Shqipëri, një ish organizat e quajtur e konsideruar terroriste nga OKB dhe aktualisht nuk konsiderohet më e tjil, një organizat e cila ka operuar në Irak. Ne do të flasim me zonjën end, sot e kemi të ftuar në studio, është një privilej që për ne, dhe do të flasim me të më shumë detaje rrët kësaj organizate, do të flasim se si funksionon kjo organizate, ajo ka qërë një antare kësaj organizate për rrët 20 vite, dhe një shumë njërë se si funksionon, është një e rekrutuar, po të themi, nga kjo organizate, një angleze e rekrutuar nga kjo organizate në Angli, Kemi gjithashtu të ftuar doktor Olcia Zegji, i cili do të nga jabë po ashtu me ndimin e ti duke njohur mirë lindjen e mesme, duke njohur mirë geopolitikën edhe interesat e ndryshme që luhen në këtë rast dhe rolin e Shqipëris dhe përfitimet apo hunge që ka Shqipëria nga prezenca e kësaj organizate në vëndin tonë. Intervisa do t'jetë në anglisht, me qenë se kemi zonjën anë në angleze, do të bëjmë një prezentim tani në anglisht dhe do të vazhdoj më te me pyre tjetë. So, dear viewers of Impact TV, Selamu Aleikum Rahmetullah, today we are going to talk about the existence of the Iranian Mujahideen organization in Albania. This ex-terrorist organization, which was relocated from Iraq to Albania under a deal that the Albanian government signed with the Obama administration in 2013, has become a major terrorist organization which Albania hosts. While Albania produced many Wahhabi jihadi fighters who joined the jihad in Syria in 2013 and later, at present, the Albanian state is accused by Turkey and Iran to host two other terrorist organizations. Turkey claims that members of FETO, the Fetullah terrorist organization, are hiding in Albania, while Iran has launched a number of complaints against the Albanian government for hosting the Mujahideen organization in Albania. This organization has carried a number of terrorist acts against Iran, Iraq and a number of other countries in the Middle East. It has assassinated a number of Iranian politicians, scientists, etc. and many Arabs and Kurds in Iraq. However, since its agenda fits with the neocon imperialist agenda of the United States in the Middle East, they have been rehabilitated rehabilitated in and are treated as freedom fighters in Albania. Many U.S. senators come to Albania time after time where they meet Mariam Rajavi, the head of this ex-terrorist organization, and they make open calls for war against the state of Iran. We call these calls for war a jihad number two. To further discuss MAC and its agenda in Albania and the Middle East today, we have two very special guests in our program. The first is Mr. Anne Singleton. She has been a guest of our debates via Skype before and has finally come to Albania. Welcome, Mr. Anne. Ms. Anne. She is a British national and an ex-Mujahideen member whose interests are the study are the, the study of terrorist organization, modern slavery, rehabilitation, and the process of deradicalization. Our second guest is Dr. Olsi Azeji, a historian who has written ex extensively in the Albanian press about the coming of MAC to Albania and has participated in a number of TV debates about MAC in our country. Let us start our debate with Ms. Anne Singleton. <coughs> Miss Singleton, welcome to Albania. What brings you in our country and can you tell us how did MAC end up in Albania from Iraq? Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure to actually meet you in person at last. Um, as um, uh, you know from my previous interview, I've been involved with the Mujahideen for uh, around 
40 years, 20 years uh, in membership with them and also 20 years now trying to rescue uh, the other members who want to leave. Um, why I'm in Albania, um, I, I have worked with the Mujahideen uh, former members in Iraq uh, for, for many years, uh, trying to rehabilitate them, get them back into normal life, to escape from this um, situation of being forced to be terrorists. Um, and since the uh, Mujahideen members have moved to Albania, we've had a lot of problems um, which have arisen from the conditions in which they are uh, here. Um, what really prompted me to come here this time was a, a very distressing phone call which um, a, a friend of ours had from his cousin. His cousin was still in the Mujahideen and he said to, his, uh, to our friend, I want to leave but I can't because I have nothing, I have no money, I have no identity, I have nowhere to go, I've got no contacts in the outside world, I don't speak Albanian help, what can I do? And we have found that this is a typical kind of uh, distress uh, call that people are, are making. So I thought it's best I come here, talk to these people and find out from the authorities here, uh, the, the government officials, from um, the United Nations officials um, and, and whoever else is involved in the care of these people, what is the situation? Why? Why are these people in, in distress. Um, the reason that uh, the Mujahideen were brought to Albania in, in, in itself is, is very interesting because since they've been here their status has been in, unclear, very unclear. Are they terrorists? Are they not terrorists? Are they um, citizens here? What, what's going on? In Iraq it was very clear after 2003, and they lost the patronage of <coughs> Saddam Hussein, of course the Mujahideen have been in, in Iraq for 30 years, um, why did they have to leave? Because after Saddam Hussein, they continued with their terrorist activities. They weren't active themselves, but they were facilitating uh, the activities of groups like Daesh, uh, Islamic State, as we call it in, in the UK, uh, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, they were facilitating their activities. And so the government of Iraq were determined to expel them from that country. Um, so make no mistake that this is a group which has continued to be active in the field of anti-Iran uh, and anti-West, um, uh, anti-Iraq activity. Um, they came to Albania basically because no one else would have them. Uh, in reality, um, Romania was asked, the government said no, we don't want them. Uh, and a, some part of the Obama administration, Hillary Clinton, a foreign secretary, um, paid a lot of money to Albanian government to host them here, uh, and so here they are. They, they started moving in 2013, and the final group um, arrived in 2016. So they've been here for just over a year in totality. But uh, is it changed their status after they come here? So are they being normal people or are they being radicalized here? Why are they are here? Yes, well, this is the question, isn't it? Because when, when they were brought here, what we understood... Just to live or...? We understood that they were going to be brought to Albania and de-radicalized, that they were going to be... Uh, the group would be dismantled, they would go uh, and go back to normal life um, and that they, they would not be an organization. Unfortunately, um, there are many, many uh, factions in, in the West uh, who want them to remain as a, well, you won't call them a terrorist group in the sense that they are not active as terrorists, but they are active in supporting and promoting terrorist activity uh, or, or violent uh, activity. So when you mentioned that American senators and, and such like John Bolton has been here, the former um, UN ambassador to America, 
Senator John McCain has been here and they, they are uh, using the Mujahideen as a propaganda outlet. So as long as they say what the West wants them to say, they will of course be supported. Um, but that means of course then that what are we dealing with? Are we dealing with people who've been brought from Iraq to put them back into normal society? Or are we actually dealing with a new version, as you say, Jihad 2, mm. of a, a wave of anti-Iran, anti-Iraq, <coughs> anti-Syria kind of um, activity. Mujahideen are very good at propaganda. It's what they've been doing for, for many years. And yeah. uh, that's oh, why they're they're in the ideology we're going to ask you later, let me ask uh, Mr. Uh, Yazuji. You have participated in a number of public discussion here in Albania about the coming of the MAC. You have described this organization as a threat to national security of Albania. How do you describe their presence in Albania today? Well, thank you for the question. I have been in the media of Albania from uh, the first moment when uh, <coughs> their coming to Albania was announced, and I was very concerned about that. Well, uh, I mean, as a historian that I am, and uh, an expert on anti-terrorism in a way, uh, I've been very worried during the past years for a number of uh, policies that the Albanian government has undertaken. I've written in Albanian press since 2012, when the process of the, of radicalization of uh, Sunni and 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 uh, mainly Wahhabi Muslims was happening in in, in Western Balkans. Uh, this process of radicalization, which uh, started uh, throughout the Balkans, with the uh, support of a number of Gulf countries, particularly Saudi government, Qatar, and what have you led to uh, the radicalization of many Albanian Muslim youth who ended up to be jihadists in Syria. And uh, in that time, uh, I've written so many articles and warning uh, Muslim believers of our region, be them in Kosovo, in Macedonia, or even here in Albania proper, to do not uh, uh, engage themselves in some violent conflicts outside of our country. Since, um, number one, uh, when the war in Syria started, this was not a war that belonged to Albania. Moreover, Albanians couldn't understand what was going on in the Middle East, and in the time of saying that this is not a war for Islam, it is not a war for bringing democracy, but it is a, a big and a greater geopolitical war between Russia and the United States. And uh, then the process of so-called de-radicalization, which in my opinion sometimes is a process of humiliation, of uh, Muslim communities that is happening throughout uh, Balkans and, 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 and Europe as well, uh, put the finger of blame on Muslim communities by claiming that they are terrorists, they are radicals, Islam is bad religion and what have you. And at the peak of this process of their radicalization, at, at the time when the, the Americans decided to uh, retreat from their jihad in Syria, uh, suddenly we have a new jihad coming, and this is the jihad against Iran. And the coming of uh, Mecca in Albania, for me, uh, created a, a second jihadist scenario that I foresee coming in the Middle East, where Albania, the citizens of Albania, is uh, entering into a conflict that, number one, doesn't belong to us, Number two, we do not know the end result. And number three, is it is a crime. Uh, uh, as Anne, who is an expert on MAC, already explained, this is an old terrorist organization which existed probably before we were even born. We have a long history of vendettas, killings, killing uh, Iranian and Arab politicians. And Americans. And Americans. Uh, uh, I mean, this is a very bloody organization, yes. in few words. Mm -hmm. And uh, its coming in Albania was a great concern for me, and for not only for me, but for the whole Albanian civil society. When uh, John Kerry came in Albania in February 2015, if I'm not wrong, there was a big uh, uproar in the Albanian media, and it was not only me, but there were so many other writers, some of them <coughs> be Muslim, some of them be Islamophobes, 
and what have you, and everybody was protesting against our government, was saying what the hell does our government want by bringing these people into Albania. And as Anna already explained, the Americans who were very desperate on, uh, in a way, finding a base for their uh, nexus of jihad, nexus of terrorist organization, uh, they, they, they struggled so much throughout the Middle East and Europe to find a base for these people and nobody was willing to accept them. Saudi Arabia would not accept them, which is the motherhood Why of, they don't of, of accept them? Who wants them? They're in trouble. Who wants them? And, and we know the story that Romania rejected them, Macedonia rejected them, Western European countries do not want them. Well, America... Just, let that, let yeah, us just make say it that one, one of the reasons that um, these countries wouldn't accept them is because instead of uh, when they were expelled from Iraq, the idea was that they would just be expelled back to their normal lives. But what the Americans were proposing was that a terrorist group was moved en masse to another country. And no country in the world wants to accept a terrorist group, even if they call themselves former terrorists. Exactly. And and when they stay as a group, yes, uh, they exactly. come here and they stay as a group. Yeah. They are organized too. They are not living uh, normal lives. Uh, in a debate that I had with uh, Albania's ex-deputy uh, foreign minister, we had a debate about their coming in top channel, top show TV at the time when their coming was announced. I openly told to the people who were, in a way, uh, saying the Americans are our friends, I call them our colonizers, and we have to do them a favor. And I was told to them, and, 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 and we have to uh, take this Mujahideen in Albania because their life is threatened in Iraq. And what I said in that time, I said, all right, Albania is taking this Mujahideen back in the country. But I made a question, are these people coming as individuals or as an organization? And what I guessed in that time, I said that these people are coming as an organization in this country, they'll have military camps in this country, and they will probably in the future conduct military terrorist actions against foreign countries. In that time, uh, Edith Harji, who has been uh, uh, in British government deputy foreign minister, she told me, no, they're coming as, as, human, uh, as, as uh, refugees, we're giving them asylum, they are good guys, I mean, uh, so forth. And uh, I, I told her, no, the time will show that these people are coming to Albania to make troubles. And what we have seen in the, in the past months, with the coming of a number of U.S. senators, delegations who come from the United States, whenever they come, Rajavi gathers her diehards around them and they make open calls for doing a war against other foreign countries. Yes, violent regime change. Violent regime change, which and, is, and uh, hold on, and according to Albanian yeah. penal code, what Rajavi and her group is doing in Albania is a call to terrorism. Here in this country, we have uh, uh, simple Albanian Muslims who only say, because they say ISIS is good, or Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is good, they go end up in jail, and they're, 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 they're condemned with jail time. Rajavi and her Mujahideens, her jihadis, they make in a in, uh, her fighters, you, uh, you have to say. Uh, they're jihadis <laughs> or fighters or whatever they are. They make open calls for making wars against a foreign country, something that is legally a crime in Albania. And our government, because our government is very much afraid of the Americans, doesn't send them to jail. I, and I, that I, is the reason why I see them as a threat I understand, to our I, national security. I do understand your concerns, and that, that is, they're very real. Um, I just have to say two things. One, one is that uh, the Mujahideen are also calling from, for regime change, violent regime change, from Paris. And they are preparing to be democratic. And they, they are presenting themselves as a political organization. Uh, in terms of uh, their ideology, their beliefs, they are certainly not uh, democratic. But also, um, I, you know, if it what helps... What is their with, ideology? Well, I, I want to say that some reassurance is the fact that this, this group, most of the members are so old and sick and, and, you know, they've been on this job for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, I don't think that they themselves present a physical threat, but they certainly can facilitate and help other organizations. And because of 
Albania's situation uh, as a, a kind of pathway into uh, the eastern war front, if you like, uh, they, they can be quite problematic in that way. The belief system of the Mujahideen is, is very uh, complex because on the surface they will tell you that they are um, wanting to bring democracy to Iran, they present themselves as feminists, they have a female leader, um, and, and they, they kind of try to fit into a Western agenda for like, other like, countries. Like the Free Syrian Army, when, when it said it's jihad in Syria, they, they come in name of they, democracy. They, they fit their, uh, their public uh, brand, if you like, to fit that kind of, let's bring democracy to, to so the So it East. is a political organization or no religion it's organization? Neither. It's neither. It is a mind-control cult. Now, a lot of... Um, uh, the what we call terrorist groups they recruit and they maintain their members using all kinds of psychological manipulation um, the Mujahideen are absolute experts at this they've been doing this for for many many years that they will engage their members in a belief system so they say, this is our belief, we want to bring a caliphate, we want to bring uh, dem no. democracy, we want to bring something, human rights. Human rights. They, they engage the members, they recruit them on that basis. But behind the scenes, they are using a lot of manipulative behavior, which is well known and well recorded among cult experts. Um, and and it, it, it's what we call in lay terms brainwashing, essentially. Uh, and the, the recruit is not aware of this. Um, they don't realize they're being manipulated. And, and it's, it's a whole separate program to explain what these methods are. The but same methods that happened during the, uh, the brainwashing of people who joined ISIS. Exactly. It was the same process. Exactly, yes. Uh, there are many people who paid to, to take part in terrorism. They're mercenaries. But in the Mujahideen, the whole group are... Uh, people who've been uh, manipulated to the point where they are actually afraid to speak. The, the restrictions on them in the organization are so severe that they, they can barely even think for themselves anymore. So they are really in a state of um, um, captivity, enthrallment, mentally, physically. Um, and so the, the, there is a complete discrepancy between the membership's own existence and their own life experience where they have gender segregation, they have strict rules, they have uh, no thought and, and life of their own, they have to obey orders. And the outside presentation of the group which says we are democratic, we want to bring democracy and human rights to Iran. But how, how can they bring democracy in this way? If their members want to leave this organization, they cannot leave this organization mm. and they are being threatened from this organization. How? Indeed. Well, they can't. That's the whole point, isn't it? That why mm -hmm. this is, you know, why am I uh, here in Albania? Is to, to try to unpick this, this conundrum about who are these people? What do you want from them? What, you know, the Americans want them to be one thing, but they, they're not that and they can't be that. They cannot be the front for uh, anti-Iran activity. It's a group which is, is being hollowed out from behind, if you like. Mm -hmm. I mentioned at the beginning the phone call we had. Um, it, it was very disturbing. Many, many, many of the people who were brought to Albania by the Americans and, and also uh, apparently the UN was involved, um, they don't want to continue like this. They want to stop this and they want to go home. They want to get, have a normal life. They want to have a family. Some of these people, they haven't even seen a, a, a child for 20 years. It's incredible. And they want to leave, but they can't. Uh, Dr. Olsi has a recent editorial that was published by Pepe Escobar at Sputnik with the title Jihad No. 2, The Making of the Next Nightmare. You are quote as saying that in Albania we have two major terrorist organizations being protected by the Americans and the Europeans. The first is what Ankara describes as the Fetullah Gulen terror organization, FETO. And the second is Mujahideen al-Haq, 
which fights against Tehran. Can you tell us why is Albania hosting such terrorist organization in its ter territory? Albania prides itself as a country of religious tolerance and has joined a number of American missions in the fight against terrorism. Why is that that is hosting two terrorist organizations in its territory? Well, this is a big question mark that I raise very often in, in my articles and uh, my different interviews because, uh, and this is one of my main critics that, uh, uh, criticism that I direct towards the Albanian government because while our govern, government claims to be a government, even though now it's in, in, in a big scandal because of the scandal of uh, Saimir Tahiri, ex big uh, narco trafficking smuggling operation anyhow uh, it is it is a big irony what's going on here in albania while our government under the orders of the americans is in a way trying to de-radicalize uh, salafi sunni muslims who were uh, sympathizing the jihad in syria they're doing a good job for that even though sometimes it, it, it is a lot of waste of money and mainly it's propaganda uh, on the other hand, what we see, we see our government uh, w is being faced with the complaints of two major governments from the Middle East, Turkey and Iran. We had uh, a few days ago in uh, Duras, a major exponent of FETA organization who was uh, arrested by the Albanian police and if I'm not mistaken, he was in a wanted list by Interpol and our government, instead of extraditing this suspected man of, of supporting the coup against the Turkish government, they released him. And on the, on the other hand, we have the MAC, which, uh, as I mentioned before, they, they make some scandalous and frightening calls for jihad or war against their home country, which is Iran. Why is Albania doing these things? As I say quite often in my interviews, because Albania has lost its independence, because our government doesn't want to listen to our civil society and to the independent voices who advise our government not to put our country into the harm's way. And uh, in a way, our prime minister is a bit adventurous. He likes to, to, to do very stupid things time after time. And what he is doing is really a crime. I'm very concerned about what's going on in Albania. I'm very concerned that major uh, Middle Eastern governments like Turkey and Iran are very upset with our country. And I'm frightened and, and I think even there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of Albanian citizens who like me feel threatened with uh, the adventure with war and terrorism that our government is doing. It is a, a, a very worrying development. and. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, the international community, who is also very worried, especially w about the coming of Mac in Albania, especially Western Europeans, will do something and uh, will advise our government not uh, to enter into such dangerous paths. The interview that you mentioned, Jihad 2.0, that was uh, published by Sp Sputnik, shows, uh, I mean, the worrying trend that uh, international medias have when they deal with Albania. Uh, Miss Singleton, as a lawyer that I am by, uh, as I am by training, I see the many MAC members are abandoning their organization in Albania. However, the majority of MAC members are still being kept within the organization by the financial uh, initiatives that this organization gives to its members. Can you explain us uh, why don't the MAC integrate in society like other refugees? Uh, why is the, what is their agenda in Albania? What is their statue in Albania? Okay, so um, I, I'm going to just draw the discussion away from politics because I don't uh, have any uh, uh, political agenda um, and, and I don't kind of want to uh, that to be the defining uh, framework for the Mujahideen's uh, involved, uh, presence in, in Albania. Um, the, let, let me just mention their behaviour. Um, you know, the, the Mujahideen, when they came here, uh, there's many refugees and different people in Albania, uh, 
they come, they go. But the behaviour of these people is very different um, from from those people, and it, it's quite alienating and frightening for, for local citizens because it looks abnormal. As I was explaining, the reason that they behave differently is because they are brainwashed people. Um, and, and they are brainwashed, uh, they've been brainwashed over the many years to obey orders so that they will kill and die to order. So that sounds very frightening. However, the the reality is, is um, that they are now at a stage where they can be re rehabilitated and, and and you mentioned that uh, the word de-radicalization that's a very controversial word in many ways because it can be used in different ways what i would prefer to to uh, talk about in terms of these mujahideen who want to leave is that they need to be rehabilitated back into society they need to be um, take out those ideas of violence and, violence and obedience and, and such like and, and become normal citizens. How this is to be done, uh, th there's uh, many, many ways. But what is relevant at this moment is how they were brought to Albania. Um, the agreement which the Americans struck with the Albanian government, um, we don't know what it is. You're a lawyer. You've spoken to the United Nations, the UNHCR, yeah. and they have explained, have they not, that these people were brought by agreement. What agreement? Where is it? It is secret. It's a secret they agreement. The other thing is that... Um, Sometimes they are saying there is no agreement because they don't want to keep that secret. Sometimes mm. in other media, by other opinionists and analysts, it's pretended that there is an agreement and there is secret. I think it's very clear. There's no doubt whatsoever, no matter what they want to say. If you do not have refugee status, if the United Nations have not given you refugee status in Albania, you have no status. In that respect, they have been trafficked here, have they not? They are not legal citizens. They don't have national citizenship. They don't, they don't have, have ID card, they don't have ID, ID number. Cards. Exactly. They don't have a passport. Now, if and you we cannot apply for them for a work permit. work permit, for residency. So they are being here in waiting for what? Yeah. What are they waiting they're to, to be? They're not allowed even to work. We, to have a, to have if you don't have an ID number, yes. ID card, a passport, you cannot get your papers. They are being kept as hostages. They they are slaves. It's not even hostages. If I may say that, if you are Objects. brought, if you are brought as a group under a secret agreement, which you personally have not signed because none of the ex-members that I have ever spoken to have signed any document with any American yeah. or UN or Albanian government. They individually have no knowledge of any agreement. So what are they? They are an object which has been bought and sold. So they took them from Iraq, the Americans have sold them to the Albanian government. Well, they're, they're in but this is they're modern slaves. Inhuman. It's inhuman. <laughs> so when they want to leave, like ISIS slaves, <laughs> they have nothing, and they have no. You know, they have. ISIS doesn't have America like they have. Hmm. ISIS is not uh, receiving U.S. senators in their <laughs> government. <laughs> no, no, they, they in their place. No, they had John Kerry at the very beginning, anyhow. There are four senators before some yeah, months yeah. here. So you, you did ask about, you know, you mentioned, uh, you said about the Mujahideen's financial incentives. <clears throat> what we are told, um, both myself and, and you, when you've been there trying to represent uh, ex-members, is that uh, the Mujahideen themselves are responsible for the financial support of their members. <sighs> And that's but the organization. The organization, yes. Where this money is coming from. Where it's coming from and, and why are you giving, why is that money given to an organization and not to the individual people? If, if they were refugees, and they, they would have, have an allowance. And they have bank accounts and this organization is giving them cash money. Mm. And this makes very doubt thing. They are signing in some papers, but not receiving from bank this yes. money. Yeah. Even the members, I say. Okay. I mean, so this makes very suspicious. 
of course it's the, the, the amount of money coming amount of money being given to the members mm. so this this make a, a lot of money a big money is uh, in game I, I mean. this is this is very very typical of mujahideen behavior that we've seen for 40 years that they they will take money mm. from anywhere they can and none of it at all absolutely none of it goes to the membership <coughs> and that is is slavery the, the members are in a state of modern slavery in this organization in this country which albania uh, i have to say is is kind of notorious for trafficking for organized crime you know we have a big problem in in western europe with albanian gangs coming and trafficking people why are the mujahideen treated differently why is your um, minister the deputy minister um i, I I'm not sure of her name, Eliana. Alma. Alma. Yeah. Eliana Jebrea. Uh, yeah, that's. No, this the picture. No, no, she's talking about Eliana Jebrea. Yes, okay. I am. Yes, uh, and and she has been to see Maryam Rajavi and said, "Well done. Uh, you know, you're welcome in our about. country." These are trafficked people. They're slaves. Why is your anti-trafficking minister coming and saying, "Well done"? Yeah. She, you know, she she needs to answer that. Because the narrative that is being portrayed in our media is that these are some good freedom fighters who mm. fight for democracy against mm. the mullahs in Iran, mm. and they were about to be killed by Iranian uh, government, mm -hmm. and we sent the Superman who saved them, and finally we are supporting Superman and bringing democracy and freedom to Iran. This is a stupid narrative that is being portrayed in it's, our media. It's but a false narrative. Is <coughs> <coughs> the reality is different, very much different. It is very different. That's a false narrative. Yeah, as you know. So, Dr. Yazidji, what do you think the future will bring for MAC in Albania? Well, uh, with the present policies of the American administration in the Middle East, uh, with what we're seeing today with the uh, soft coup data in uh, Saudi Arabia, where a number of uh, princes and ministers are being arrested, and with a push to war that uh, the neocon lobby is doing in the United States for uh, doing a war against Iran, I'm afraid that sooner or later the Mujahideens will be, in a way, uh, pushed into the fire of the Middle East, and uh, I'm afraid they will become the Jihad 2.0 of, of uh, America in the Middle East. In my opinion, they are the second uh, Daesh, uh, who are being, in a way, uh, being, uh, in a way, kept in here, trained, uh, used, and uh, one day they will be thrown as a terrorist in the Middle East. Uh, unfortunately, this is the truth, and uh, it all depends on how the big geopolitical clash of two titans of the international system, Russia and the United States are going to play the coming conflict of the Middle East, but uh, I'm afraid uh, that the uh, MEC is going to be used. Moreover, uh, yesterday or before yesterday, I read one article from the Forbes magazine, and now they're, they're uh, uh, MEC, who they go by their uh, good and sexy name, uh, what, what is it called? Uh, the National Council National of Resistance. Of resi no, no, they have no. even one more, which was is even more fashionable, something National uh, Opposition of Iran. They, they, they invent very good names. And um, they were claiming that Iran had connections with uh, Al-Qaeda and Bin Laden, so they're giving those facts to, to administration of Trump. So they're doing a very bloody work uh, for uh, destroying their own country, and I'm afraid that uh, they will be used as uh, the so-called Free Syrian Army, and later Daesh and Nusra will use for destroying Syria. They are part of the bigger geopolitical game that the United States plays against the Middle East, uh, and the uh, end result of it is war, terrorism, and destruction, unfortunately. And they don't know anything about this. I, I think that, you know, I mean, you, you're painting quite a, a, a sort of drastic picture, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but I think that we have to be uh, a bit more proactive in, in sort of coming in between this argument, the political argument. We have to actually get down to the, the grassroots of the people here and try and sort them out so that we can actually take um, the, the 
power out of the hands of these these warmongers and such like. And what uh, I'm hoping to do while I'm here is to talk to various um, authorities and officials and explain to them that there are many, many people in this organization who do not want to be forced to be terrorists. They don't want to be forced to partake in these activities. Let us allow them to leave with dignity and with honesty. And one of the best ways we can do this is to first and foremost, allow them to contact their families. Because what we found, I, I work in the UK in what you call the prevent uh, duty, which is the counter-terrorism activities, trying to prevent people from getting involved in terrorism um, and, and going to Syria and, and Iraq and such like, which are now uh, closing down. But uh, one of the things, the major uh, uh, important things is that when families are involved with keeping their family member away from terrorism, it's very effective. It's much more effective than, than a, you know, the government saying do this or don't do that. That is a kind of top-down approach. What we found, especially in Iraq, helping the uh, Mujahideen there, is that when you allow them to contact their families, their families will help them and they'll talk to them. And that emotional tie is very, very important for, for rehabilitation of that person and as, as well as that we have many families um, of the Mujahideen who are uh, able to financially support their relatives and so that would actually um, it, it unburdens the authorities here they don't have to pay for these people because their families will do it yeah, but there are some problems mm. first our government is not giving visa for their families and they cannot come from Iran here. Mm -hmm. And they have so many difficulties to contact their people. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is about the families living in Iran. Mm -hmm. There are some families living in Europe, mm -hmm. even being Europeans, mm -hmm. for example, uh, from Italy. They are coming to meet here MAC members. Mm -hmm. Once one of them contacted me as a lawyer and he's been detained here from the police and he couldn't contact his uncle and he's being a student in Italy and he has Italian documents and he doesn't understand the reason why the police is staying behind me for two days I'm being in Tirana and forced me to leave Albania and kept me for 13 hours without making any question anything why what is the crime I met I made why these people are calling police once I try to contact my uncle and why my uncle is being said to him that this uncle doesn't want to meet his nephew. Mm -hmm. So this is the reality. Yeah. Even when the families try to contact them, the government, our government, our police are not helping them. This is the root of the problem, isn't it? And this is what we need to, we need to unpick piece by piece and expose what is actually happening here with the Mujahideen. It, it, at present, you know, you're, you're getting, as you say, the media talks about them as a group or the government treats them as a group. What we need to do is start unpicking the individual members' experiences. That yes, when I tried to call my mum that I haven't spoken to for 20 years, the Mujahideen cut my money. How can they yeah. do that? How, how is that possible if they're refugees, if they are... You know, how is that possible anyway in any country? And they country? call all of them Iranian agents. Anyone who, Anyone who wants is to leave critical them. of the... Exactly, critical of the Mujahideen. They don't want to be aid. critical, maybe. They just want to live their life. Exactly. <laughs> to a exactly. normal life, to have a normal life and have as the, a human. Enjoy their human rights. Yeah. If, if you are a prisoner in any country, you can, you can contact your family, no matter how harsh the prison situation is. You know, there's a kind of understood yeah, this shouldn't it's an be understanding in that they yeah. shouldn't be in the, under discussion to have a family <laughs> we understand uh, <coughs> and then this is why anytime we talk to any of these authorities they'll talk about this agreement what is the agreement we need to know what this agreement is i don't believe there is an agreement i think it's it's a uh, well if, if it is it's certainly not a humanitarian agreement it certainly doesn't uh, clarify the status of these people here and it doesn't give them any help or freedom. So 
and doesn't respect human rights. And it doesn't they, respect they, human rights. They are treated as uh, Yazidi slaves of, uh, of Daesh in Iraq. The same treatment, I mean, nobody can access them. Nobody can access them. And, and one, one of our greater concerns uh, recently was um, that the Mujahideen really want to isolate their members because they don't want them to leave. They don't want to give them any opportunity whatsoever to, to just leave. Um, and, and they were making efforts to put them in different places to keep them isolated. And fortunately, um, that hasn't and won't happen um, because it won't be possible. But yeah, little by little, we need to kind of, as I say, expose the, the grassroots level what's happening. Uh, at least we have to inform the people what is happening about this group, this organization, and the problematic they have here in Albania, and what mm. our government should do to help them. Yes. Because should help the people who wants to leave terrorist organizations, not the, the people who wants to join this. Indeed, yes. Yeah, yes. Because we have other uh, Muslims, as Olsi mentioned, that being jailed just for one word. Mm. And now these people that want to be normal, to live normally, they are not being held by our government. Yes. Okay, uh, I thank you so much uh, for enlightening our <laughs> viewers. Miss Singleton will be with us to part two of this uh, uh, view, uh, this show, with other member Mac that will join us in our part two of this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Olsi Azizhi.